thinking about Samilo and why we is celebrate him so much, wondering how his actions relate to you and influence your present quality of life? Pause. Think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. Stay tuned and hear what Loretta Butler Turner got to say about the impact of her grandfather's daring adventures, political combat, and plots and counterplots. Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. What we think, we become. What we radiate, we attract. What we imagine, we surely can achieve. Let's change the narrative, 242. Welcome to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knowles. Join our co-sponsors, Dom Dev Enterprises and Page Investments, and our friends at Something to Think About in the discussion this evening that we're going to have. Post your questions, comments, and suggestions because we want this to be a lot, a lit conversation. We have our guest, the extraordinary one and only Loretta Butler Turner. Welcome, LBT. Well, listen, you know you're my good friend, so you give me an awesome introduction. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, now, just look at you. You know, you in a nice, pleasant environment, cozy and the like. But you're all colonially polished. You're a Miss Photogenic person, a photographic genic person. You also have um, this most elegant uh, nation-building type spirit to yourself. And you really sit amongst queens. You know, uh, you have all of those qualities that they say. But, you know, there's something, even though we have all of these polished stuff on the outside, there's something deep, 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 deep inside that drives us, that no matter how polished or how whatever we are, those are the things that really are important. And we want to talk about where you got that from. I mean, it's maybe only one portion, but we're going to talk about some Milo today. So what do you think about that? That's a good topic for us. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. You know, you may not know this, but I was born, bred, lived my entire life in the pond. And that was in the shadows of my grandparents. And obviously, to this day, I still live just a stone's throw away from the pond. Wow, well, mm -hmm. that's cool. Awesome stuff there. You know, when they say you, you, your navel spend navels, navel string very close, so you got to stay close, kind of thing. Well, so, I also believe that you know, family was very, very important to the butlers. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of history that was imparted to us by growing up under our parents, our grandparents, our aunts uncles and the extended neighborhood which is like family so i'm very comfortable in this environment and i think all of that helped to mold me into the human being that i am today yes that's awesome so just a little background folks loretta butler turner um we all know her to be like i said this beautiful person um so forth but she's a businesswoman of the highest acumen She's a stately politician. Um, she says she's retired, but I never believe that. Um, great tenacity. Um, she is a professional, a family um, woman, mother, generous friend. And that's what I hold highly um, about her. Um, people see all these things, but they don't understand what the grit is that drives these individuals to become passions towards excellence. And so, yes, uh, we know about all these things, but the cover on inside that book of the person named Loretta Butler Turner is deep down inside this is your soul. You have this pedigree of relentless nation building, always driven to uplift people no matter their walk in life. And I saw this first when I um, would interact with you when you were managing the funeral home. Um, 
I didn't have no business being there, but just because <laughs> you were there. <laughs> You know, you, you get to see you in motion, in different functions and, and quadrants, etc. And so that pedigree obviously has stuck um, around and been embedded deep into the root of your soul to be able to go. And by folks, don't be mild, um, confused with the beauty and the gentleness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these are what we, in the Bahamas, we call them Bantown women spirit. And when you cross the line and, and tick them off, the devil can run. So, you know, and I believe your grandfather was had that spirit. Uh, well, anyway, we'll talk about that. So, Well, what I loved about my grandfather, and it's not just my grandfather, because you also have to understand that he came from almost a single parent family because he was, okay. he was, his father died when he was very, uh, very young. And his mother, we've got to talk about, we cannot talk about Sir Milo without mm -hmm. talking about his mother, Mother Frances Butler. And, you know, while we talk about Sir Milo, Mother Frances Butler has always been a social activist. And you would know, Happy, that mm -hmm. she actually formed the YWCA, mm -hmm. the Mother's Club, um, the Silver Bell. And there were just so many things she did in the community, especially back in the early 20s, when um, a lot of our forebears were on the contract. She was she, she created a social network for the mothers and families here at home to ensure that they knew how to foster better families. Right. Yes, and that 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 is awesome. And and I think people like my mom, those got that um, spirit also because they formed um, a group of themselves, um, what they call the MRS group, for like MRS, married women, to help them. None of them really knew how to be um, mothers, etc. And so they, I guess it's an extension of that same spirit. Um, today they still have members and, and they still meet. So that, those are two tips, people, that I think if you're taking notes, because you should pull out your notebook, whether it's a digital one or a paper one, and take notes because there's going to be lots of tips here today as to how to be successful. You might hear it spelled out, but if you listen carefully or refresh on it later, you will realize that these are things that people did that caused them to be successful along the way. So and when you think of the parallels of your mom, your Aunt Capella, your mm -hmm. Uncle Georgie, and of course, Mrs. Dillette, mm -hmm. whose homestead still stands in Cookingham today, an historical homestead. You know, the thing is, people need to understand their history. I always believe that if we don't know our history and we don't know the contributions of our forebears, then mm -hmm. we don't know whose shoulders we're standing on. So when we think of your mom and the work and the philanthropic work that she has done and the Glow Guide, in helping to foster young women so that they can reach their fullest potential. Those things are so important to our social development. Right. Very much so, yes. So I mean, let's let's see if we could do this thing here now. So they tell me that Samilo, and you know, it's interesting that we call him Samilo um in the Bahamas, because I know he was more Bahamian than he was Sir, but that's a different well, that's part of this conversation, but that's for later in it, maybe. But um, they tell me that he was a smooth, suave type person, always well put together, uh, but he was purposeful. A man who was always purposeful, purposeful and had strong principles. So a loving man, um, family man, who um, knew when to play and when to be intentional. And, you know, we're all about being intentional on this show. So tell us. From your perspective as a grandchild, etc., how would you describe Samilo? There's so many ways in which we can describe our grandfather, but I think first and foremost, he would appreciate being described as a Christ-like man. Okay. Um, I say that without a shadow of a doubt. This is a man that actually 
carried his Bible even into the political war field. He worked regularly at St. Matthew's Church. He was one of the earliest vestry members of St. Matthew's Church. And he instilled in his family the importance of Christian principles. So having said that, he actually lived his life guided by those principles and looking to ensure that every human being was respected just as he felt he was in the likeness mm -hmm. of God. Awesome. Because you know that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you then to tell me, was he a God-fearing man or did he put the fear of God in mind? I think, I think first of all, he was a God-fearing man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny that you should ask that question because he never backs down from a battle mm -hmm. because his motto was, as long as God was with him, he and God were the majority. So he feared mm -hmm. no one. So if he actually did the fear of God in men or opponents or adversaries, mm -hmm. It was because he went in there with the confidence that God was with him. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now that's some power because we all know to all things who strengthens us. Yes. So as children then, um, me and my brothers and sisters, we were taught that, that uh, under the tree that a man takes action when the pain to act is significantly less than the pain for him to stay in his comfort zone. So surely Samilo and his colleagues during that era of the freedom fight, et cetera, or equality fight, would have felt pain. And so then they took action. When I think of him in action, the, one of the first things that I think about was his political combativeness. And the first, one of the first things is one of my favorite holidays is then the Black Tuesday. And folks, this was the time when, um, and you could explain it better than me, was when he was a part of orchestrating, causing the mace, the symbol of authority in our parliament, to be thrown out of the window down to the people in, in Russian Square. And that had all kind of symbolic overtones and powers and, and he I guess everybody should have known there was gonna be repercussions because of that. Because you really that's almost like when I was in school and I would walk up to the playground bully and being a little short me and jump up and knock the food out the hand or hit him in the face or whatever and break off running. Um, at least I've run. But I mean he was a big man so I don't know if he had to run. But you could tell us tell us about that story a little bit. So we well, obviously, is. I wasn't born. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this story has been related to me through family and through other historians. But, of course, you understand that Lyndon Pendlin, later through Lyndon, was the leader of the PLP party. And uh, they had a very small majority in the House of Assembly at that time. And one of the things that they needed to to make a stand on was the, the UBP, the then UBP, um, was doing a lot of gerrymandering of the, of the constituency boundaries. So this was a very dynamic time because not only were they looking to ensure that they represented the masses, but they wanted to ensure that the power that the then Bay Street boys or the oligarchs who were predominantly in charge of the parliament, that they relinquished that power to the people. So mm -hmm. Sir Lyndon and Loftus Roper tells the story essentially very well, that they planned this event because they always felt that they were short-changed in parliament. And it was planned for Sir Lyndon to get the mates and throw it out to a crowd that they had invited down to Parliament Square, a crowd mm -hmm. of ordinary Bahamian citizens. Sir Milo, on the other hand, sort of being big and imposing in size, um, stood behind Sir Lyndon to sort of fortify him, if you will, and nudge him on. And so if Sir Lyndon eventually, um, after Sir Milo opened the window, threw the mains out the window, 
And Sir Milo, who was really, uh, I would say, uh, very res upset with the way that they had an hourglass mm -hmm. uh, in, in the parliament to limit the amount of time that they could speak. Once the mates went out to the people, you realize that he then picked up the mace. This was the this was not planned. He picked up the hourglass and threw it out. And of course, you know there was this huge riot, and the crowd then disseminated and went down to the southern recreation grounds, where I think this gave a great of a great a lot of a momentum to the PLP, and they subsequently won the elections of 1967 after a tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So just for context for persons out there, at this point in time in the history, there was no uh, equality. There wasn't political equality like majority rule or any so um, economic or social equality at that point in time. So this was a, a major step in getting to that point. That's right, because you're talking about in the 1950s, um, the women being Doris Johnson, the suffragettes, they had mm -hmm. fought adamantly to get universal suffrage, meaning that persons of color, both male and female, once they were Bohemian, would have the opportunity to vote. Prior mm -hmm. to that, the only people that were allowed to vote were, were basically property owners. And at that time, that was predominantly the oligarchs, the white oligarchs. Yeah. Cool. So that, that's some, some really good stuff there that is happening. So we see it as this, this is a man of structure and strength who doesn't take foolishness. So he creative in his own light to be able to throw the hourglass also out. Um, he was, because you, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to also appreciate that prior to the formation of the Progressive Liberal Party, Sir Milo had run as an independent for the Western District of New Providence in 1936. Mm -hmm. And so he had been actively involved as a young man in fighting for the rights of the masses, even before organized um, political parties. The PLP, when Sir Lyndon and um, Arthur Hanna and other persons like themselves returned to the Bahamas, in the early 50s, they were uh, gathered together with other like minds and became leaders of the PLP and Sir Milo joined the PLP party. So they actually created a political organization to go up against the oligarch of the day. Mm -hmm. um, we got the right to vote, a uh, universal suffrage movement with no um, lots of credit to the women of the day who created that environment to ensure that uh, all the humans had the right to vote. Uh, when Sir Milo joined the PLP, they became a stronger organization uh, that was able to be unified in ensuring that they fought for the rights of all the humans everywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, just to cap off the, the turn of the Mesa out the window and hourglass then, so when, when we look, look at that picture then, so that really meant in those times when the governing oligarchy really had a stranglehold on everything in this country from a power point of view. That really took a lot of courage. Economically, politically, um, educationally, every, mm -hmm. every which way you could imagine. Yeah. So that took a lot of courage for Sir Lyndon and, and, and Sir Milo to, to do what they did. So what, what would have drive that courage to, to, for a man? We already talk about the pains and stuff like that, but to dig deep to know that you, you could I think Sir Milo had endured a lot of adversity himself. Even yeah. though he was a black merchant class person and he had a business on Bay Street, you know, there was a lot of political oppression. And he had to do business with these same persons that were in parliament. And mm -hmm. there was marginalization. There was um, actually, they ostracized him because of the positions he would have taken in parliament, making mm -hmm. it very difficult for him to do business. 
with them. And so it was not just about Sir Milo. He wanted to ensure, and I think Mr. Pendling and Mr. Hanna and the others that joined them, you know, people like Sammy Isaac and all of them that were a part of the original um, seven. I think when you look at that, they, they realized that the masses were not getting proper education. They were not getting the economic opportunity. And they did not have the right to vote, to express as a full human being. So mm -hmm. to be able to uh, understand and appreciate, and I guess to be self-actualize for all the humans, that was the equality that they fought back then. That was a driving thing. This was a civil era, because if you looked at the parallels that was happening in the United States of America, we were just like one generation away from free slaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you used the word full um, person. And, you know, I've heard the term. Actualization. Yeah. You know, for everyone to be able to reach their fullest potential. And so it was important that we did not have a minority uh, wielding this amount of power over the majority of people. And I mean, whether we like to talk about the racial divide or the economic divide, it was a very real because mm -hmm. black people could not go into certain enterprises. Black people could not go into, well, generally speaking, most black people could not go into banks. And so Milo, that is another thing that he actually fought against and stood in the Royal Bank of Canada because he was a customer there and demanded that they hire people that looked like us. Yeah, I have that it was a question I had for later to, to ask you, but you put it on the table just now, but let's just slide that on side for a little bit. The, so when we look at this movement, then you had the majority rule, I mean, the Black Tuesday, there's some other major milestones in there also, but that all, they all led up to the majority rule that you were speaking of. So that self actualization or making people feel whole is the significance of what these gentlemen and ladies did back in that era. They made the nation feel like we were valued, valued, self valued. And, 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 like. and, and you know what is interesting to note is that it wasn't just about blacks and whites, you know. Right. Because when you look at people like Sir Henry Taylor and Cyril Stevenson and Mr. Cartwright and those, they were of the lighter hue, but they were not of that economic mercantile class. Right. And so they were also originators of the PLP. And it was all about bringing equality for all Bahamians. And that was Bahamians that were black, that were poor, that were white, that were poor, or that were marginalized because they didn't own property. Right. Yeah, and that, that's that's big. So that's that's that is a major milestone, or uh, um, revolution transition of the people's mindset moving forward. And so, if we look look at that also, then um, that means that. I believe that that gave people a sense that they could be brave and daring like the, the Samilos and the Randalls and the rest who aren't around there who would have been uh, not shy or scared of other people. And so we know through leadership that, you know, it's how you treat people and how you act with people is that whether they're going to follow you um, so forth. So when we look at that, did that galvanize the people? Without question, without mm -hmm. question. But you know, we cannot give all the credit to those men. Mm -hmm. And you know, this era of us as Bahamians looking for equality of the gender, you know, we must not obliterate the importance of the women yes. that yeah. actually mm -hmm. drove the suffrage movement, movement, the suffragists. Because while a lot of our men would have been involved in traveling abroad to earn a living for their families, or they were here working hard, it was through the lodges and the right. social associations that the women did all of the legwork to ensure 
that the proclamation that the Doris Johnson presented to Parliament um, had all of the signatures, you know, and they wanted to appeal to Great Britain to ensure that this inequality of all citizens being unable to vote, that it was addressed. So we have to give a lot of credit to the women. It was majority women that were in the Parliament Square when mm -hmm. Sir Lyndon threw the mace out the window. Out the window. Okay. They were huge followers. They believed in it and they drove it. And it, it was not driven by political division. It was a universal effort. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I always wonder what happened to the mace. I mean, if somebody kept it or <laughs> did the government get it back or, or so forth. But, well, you know, you, you, I wish I could tell you what happened, but I know that one thing right after that happened, um, there was a, a procession or march, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that ended up in a very significant place over the hill. Because remember mm -hmm. now, the Bain and Grandstown area mm -hmm. was where you had your emerging black class coming, and it was back to the Southern Recreation Grounds where they uh, later gathered after that incident. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that ties right in. So they, they gathered there, um, but my question is, um, how did that event cause the people to change their response to government? Did, they went to that parade um, to the government ground, and then they um, went maybe dispersed that day, but the days and months and years after leading up to majority rule, etc. How how did they, they respond? Well, I think you like to talk about being intentional. I think mm -hmm. these, this is the last time, in my opinion, that we had such an intentional movement by everyone. Because, I, and I see that because it seems like since we became independent, uh, since we got majority rule, that level of social and civil activism mm -hmm. has yet to be seen again. Mm -hmm. So they were intentional. They knew what they wanted, and they did not relent until we were able to be granted the right by the British government to have the universal vote, which, of course, you know, happened. And, of course, there was the election of 67. And... It was a gridlock, really, the results. And it was only because of Sir Alvin Brennan and uh, Mr. Fox who were able to give the PLP that edge. Once they won that election uh, of 67, they went right back into a general election in 1968 right. so that the PLP could solidify its position. And by that time, the Black and the marginalized Bahamians realized that they can have greater control over their country, over their future. And so, of course, you then had 25 years of political reign by the PLP party after that. Right. Awesome. So, and, and that's powerful in itself to be able to, to, to cause that sort of change to happen um, in the scenario. So now let's slide back into the spot where we were a couple seconds ago, which you had introduced. Um, and that was what I call the banging on the table in um, the Royal um, Bank of Canada. And so what I was taught was that, you know, so Milo was this daring adventurer who did, he always went on these, I call it pilgrimage or, or whatever the cause changed along the way. And so the story goes, as you mentioned it just now, he was just fed up with this colonial process system of feeding, uh, culture kind of thing. And um, he walked into the bank, and I say he did it like Jesus to turn over all the tables and stuff like that when he went into the temple. But, um, but he used it, and he used, um, as we say, 5 and 10 and 15 pound words, I understand was the case. We're not going to say those words here. But... The mere presence of a man, I don't know how tall he was, I can't remember what I researched, but I forgot it by now, but this was a strong-statured 
man of economic power also. Um, well, economic wealth. I don't know if it was how much power a, a man of his complexion would have had. Um, but obviously, the power with the people is the part what I think is the critical part that will make it important. So when we look at that, then, and the banging on the tables, um, was this the norm for him? Was this something that he would always do to um, gleefully shake up the world and to blatantly att attack blatantly wrong actions of people? I think he was very intentional. Remember, he has lived through a lot of what was going on in the social evolution in the United States of America because he's been exposed to that firsthand. And of course, you had the movement over in the Southern United States with mm -hmm. people uh, fighting for their rights. So, and then, of course, you had the Marcus Garvey. So there was this huge movement in the Caribbean and Southern United States for Black people to be empowered. So he was very purposeful when he first went into politics. Yes, he was a man that had financial means. It wasn't given to him. He mm -hmm. created that wealth, and he was able to go into the Royal Bank. But when you talk about the, um, how should I put it, the privilege of color, mm -hmm. that was very real in the Bahamas. You had foreigners of white complexion, you had Bahamians of very light complexion who would have passed or were white serving. Mm -hmm. And while he was respectful as he went into the bank each day, his observation was that I'm fighting for the masses, but yet I don't see people in this bank that's taking my money that looks like me. Right. And I'm going to demand that we have integration here. And so I think he was very intentional in everything that he did. And mm -hmm. this was one of those barriers that had to be broken. Bay Street, as you will recall, just down the road, there was the Savoy Theater where Black people were not allowed to go. There were businesses mm -hmm. where Black people had to enter through the back door. This was inequality. And these are the inequalities that I believe he and his fellow colleagues truly determined that they needed to fight for to have a society where everyone was um, catered to with dignity. And that was the driving force. But it goes back to the whole Christian principles, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's great. And so when we look at that, that whole that you just painted in terms. Um, I don't believe that, um, at least me as a, as a father, when I do things and I think it has some merit to it or somebody got some benefit, uh, the first thing, one of the first things I want to do is to share it with my boys, right? Well, I can't call them boys no more because they, they, they taller than me for one, so that should <laughs> tell you they got a little bit of age on them. but. So I shared with them so that hopefully they would let it sink in and maybe call on it to use it at some later point in their life when they need it, even if they're not interested in hearing what I have to say at that point in time, right? Sometimes it, you just put it in there and it stays there and it connects with something else they're doing and next thing you know they're using it. So um, when we come back, we want to talk about how he conveyed his actions to you all as young people um, or his children and then obviously from generation to generation because the Butler family has been one of iconic status for and for excellence for years, for generations. Madam Bedusa? Every scoop, lick, and savor is a smile and memory being made or reminisced. Whether you're at work, 
out with family on a Sunday, or have friends visiting, flavor will meet expectations in our 32 ounce container for only $10 if you're having a special event as well. Exotic flavors ranging from sour soft to Guinness is definitely worthwhile. Welcome back to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knowles. We're here this evening again with the lovely Loretta Butler Turner, and we're talking about her grandfather, Sir Milo Butler, and all of the great things that he would have done to cause our country to have the mindset that we have today. Not just him one, but there's a, there's a, a good group of them, I call it a posse of them, who would, we would consider the freedom fighters of the Bahamas. And, you know, they brought in majority rule and then into independence and, and we're still growing from strength to strength. And my hope is that at the end of the day, we will see some of the attributes that people like he had and see whether we could tailor those things to what we do today so that we can grow from strength to strength and move the Bahamas in leaps and bounds like how they moved it back from when they were. So welcome back, um, Loretta. How are you? Thank you, Dale. Awesome, awesome. So just before the break, we were talking about how uh, understanding how he would have passed on knowledge and wisdom to his children and grandchildren. Could you share a little bit on that? Well, let me just say that my grandmother was a very good partner, life partner for my grandfather. When my grandfather would have been out fighting or helping others, he had a wife that he could rely on. So mm -hmm. they were a team. I think that is so important to know, especially when we look at the family structure today. Mm -hmm. They insisted that we respected the hierarchy of family. Yes, they had ten children. And each of those children, even though they were very well educated, they made sure that they work in every aspect of the businesses that he had. And we growing up as grandchildren were fostered in that very same way. We had to work in the businesses. We had to respect everyone that came into those businesses. Our grandmother showed us how to be the perfect helpmate, the wife, the businesswoman, the disciplinarian, all of those roles she carried on while Sir Milo was out in his public life. So while we give a lot of accolades to Sir Milo, we also have to understand the importance of our grandmother and the mm -hmm. role that she played. I will tell you though, that whenever we had family gatherings, which was regular, we always sort of gathered around a meal and we had family meals, structured family meals. But before we even had those meals, we had to give thanks to Almighty God for providing these meals for us. And those meals were then also extended to neighbors in the neighborhood or people in need. So we were taught mm -hmm. these lessons very early that you do not just prepare enough for your family. You always have to prepare because there's going to be a travel, there's going to be a a person who does not have what you have right. and you've got to share. And we were not allowed to waste anything. You know, people look at the butlers and they realize that we're big people. 
everything that was on our plate. I don't know if it's a good thing, um, you know, given the obesity problems we had in the Bahamas, but we had to eat everything on our plate because our grandfather and our grandmother always reminded us that food could not be thrown away because there are too many hungry people in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that's a serious thing right there. So, you know, efficiency, people, uh, maybe at the dinner table, but efficiency of what we do in our actions would mean that we we make sure our actions are we are productive and our actions are efficient so that we don't have our wastage and we're gonna get more success that way too. And so forth. So And then folks they were are, never they were never um how should I put it? They were never flamboyant. Mm -hmm. They always remained very um uh, grounded even in their environment. They didn't move out of the pond. Um, they didn't do the flashy stuff like you see in Hollywood today when people have means. Instead, what, what, what they taught us was that by the brow, by the sweat of our brow, should we eat bread? And so we had to go to the farm. We had to make sure that we fed the creatures as they referred to them. We mm -hmm. had to go and shell the peas, uh, or whatever, whatever crop was coming in. We had to go and gather. And then, of course, we, some went in the shop and some went to our table. So I think that they taught us life lessons about economics, both through business, but also through the way we conducted the money that we had. Yeah. And, you know, and, and also in that whole um, explanation, you said that uh, what I heard glaring is that there was no idle time. You know, they, they always kept it busy. <laughs> so maybe that's a tip for parents today. You know, um, when we have so much people doing, going astray, maybe you just keep the children occupied. Um, Our homework. Things. Yeah. Our homework, while education was very important, our homework was of paramount importance. But many evenings, we did our homework in the stores between serving customers. And, you know, this is why we thought it important, well, especially my cousin Franklin, thought it important to share the story of our legacy mm -hmm. and how we actually are able to be where we are today. Because if you look at the Butler family, when Sir Milo started his businesses, we're now five generations out and still mm -hmm. carrying on many of the lessons that was taught to us and his children um, way back then. Yeah, well, I hope, um, um, I can call him Sir Franklin, you know, um, but I know he probably don't like that, but um, that Frankie will come on to speak on that aspect of building a nation through business and, and the generational, because we always talk about this generational curse in the Bahamas where people build up a, uh, a business and then the children generally don't want to go into that same business. They want to do something different and so forth. And, and then the business just dies out. But, you know, your family is one where the business is going on. And you just mentioned five generations. That's significant. But um, especially so, among black people, you know, yeah. we, we use the saying black crab syndrome. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is a reality. So for black families to have generational business, it is important, but it's also important to tell our story, to make sure that each successive generation understands the struggle, that they're mm -hmm. taught the ethics of business, and that they're taught that there is no idle time. When you have a business, you work 24 seven. Yeah, cool. So. Our Carol here is saying, um, what did Sir Milo teach his children about carrying on the business apart from including them in everything he did? <laughs> I've got to tell you, our Carol, he taught us by fire. Once we could walk and talk, you were doing something. Mm. But you also understood what he said to us was that even though you're under my roof, I am only here to provide your needs, not your wants. 
Mm. So that meant we had to work for all of those added pleasures we may have wanted. And it wasn't that he wasn't a kind person, right. because he gave a lot of gifts to the wider public. But he wanted us to understand that it was important that we not only work, that we take care of ourselves, but that we also help to be positive contributors to the wider society. That's awesome. So folks, just remember now, you can post your questions and we'll endeavor to answer them. Well, you know, Loretta Butler Turner will endeavor to answer them because I'm, I can't speak for what her experience was, but hopefully we'll get through what she's conveying to us on her experience to see what the experience was with the people and why we celebrate him so much. And, you know, it's, we say it's a Milo, but it's all of them, right? But That's um, right. sometimes they just because carry on with more, so just call one name. Was a pioneer. Name. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no man is an island. Right. And as I said, it was a collective effort of men and women mm -hmm. of strong mm -hmm. conviction that was able to herald in the era of universal suffrage, that was able to move us from a colony to an independent sovereign country. It's been 50 years now. And I think that the lessons that we can take from those brave men and women are still essential today. Because even though we're 50 years in, there's so much more that we have to do. Yeah. And talking about so much more we have to do, and the way we do it uh, needs to also tailor. Because they tell me this story now, um, you could tell me better than anybody else probably um, that I know about. They said that they locked up Samilo in the bathroom at Parliament. Now, I can't imagine that because it's this giant of a man of sorts and these little people locking him up. I, but I understand that was to stop him from voting. Uh, do you know the story behind that? Yes. You know, Sir Milo was vociferous. He was unruly at times. In other words, he wanted to speak beyond the 15 minutes that was set to him. And A.D. Hannah, believe it or not, was always by his side when he got into problems in Parliament. So when Sir Milo got kicked out or lifted out of Parliament by at least four or five police officers, usually A.D. Hanna was right behind him being thrown outside. So they had a, a very important vote. I'm not quite sure what they were voting on. And uh, they, you know, back in the day, they had these locks on the outside, the bolts and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they locked my grandfather. He went to his bathroom and they locked him in the bathroom so he would not vote. Mm. Wow. And, and, you know, that was just one mechanism to silence him or to weaken his position. Mm -hmm. But the, the hourglass was also another method to try and silence him. And so you saw this sort of repressive governance, if you will, where the majority did not want the minority to have their say. And they did not want them to have that moral suasion among mm -hmm. the people. These were <clears throat> these were very novel times in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Bahamians generally didn't know what it was. Black Bahamians, that is, didn't know what it was to have self governance and to have black people govern over the majority. And so right. there was a lot of dynamic things going on and. When you look at governance, the majority of the men that sat in Parliament were men of great wealth. Hmm. Yeah, so here yeah. they were going against these generally aggressive, educated Black men that wanted hmm. equality, but they used their wealth and every other mechanism to ensure that they repressed that. Yeah. And so that, that brings me to this question that we have on the title was, uh, you know, in politics, we lit it with plots. Uh, but people always tell me that there was always plots and counterplots. 
during those eras of those those day those that era of, of politics in the Bahamas. Um, I don't think it's changed. No? <laughs> yeah, but what were some of the some of the the ones that people might not speak of that you might know? Of? Um, mm-hmm. I wish I, I wish I could say, but I'll tell you, the one that was shared with me was mm-hmm. truly the fact of when they were planning throwing the maids out the window. Okay. Loftus Roker told us um, that not everybody on the PLP side knew of this plan. Mm-hmm. And it was very simple why they didn't know. Because a few of them actually worked either in the law firms or the businesses of the white oligarchs. Right. And so mm-hmm. they figured they would sort of let the cat out of the bag, if you will. So mm-hmm. it would not have come as a surprise. And it might have been foiled. So that was a plot that was successful, but that you could not share with everyone on your team. So it right. was a surprise for many of the uh, PLPs that were sitting in the room that day. Yeah. And so when and, and, and you and we have things like the dynamite on the on the dock and and some other things that was happening during those those um ten years of time. When so, Abaco did not want to become independent. Oh, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. you know, there was there when when the PLP won, mind you, the discussion of independence had already arisen because we were a self um internal yeah. governed mm-hmm colony under Sir Roland Simonet. Remember, he was our first premier. And so we had internal governance and there had to be a move towards independence. Britain wanted to offload a lot of its colonies. So the discussions, I think, were preliminary. Mm -hmm. But Abaco was one of the holdouts that did not want to become independent. They wanted to stay as a British colony. So, of course, they had their sort of altercation and everything. Right. But, of course, you know, in the end, the majority won, and the entire Bahamas became an independent nation. Right. And so that begs the question then, because, you know, in the Bahamas, we always have these people who say, oh, we never had a national development plan and, and what have you. But it seems to me that a lot of their actions were strategically planned as to how they were going to move from step to step and from stage to stage. And some of it was assisted by persons from the outside, the country, um, both sides of the color divide and, and so forth. So I don't know about um, those type of things not happening, but... Um, when when we look at this war, well, the leadership to be able to convey all of these things to a, a nation of people and to get them to move forward. Um, normally, people follow people by volunteering their services because the, the person who's leading is getting them to achieve something that the individual who's following wants to achieve. So you have to translate where you're going into a language that the person who's following can understand, appreciate, and buy into. How was that process done in terms of from the leadership of Samilo, the the Linden, uh, the early cabinets, etc.? Do you have any information on that? Yeah, we believe that a lot of this happened through the social organizations, if you will. Okay. The law, <laughs> you know, the paternal organization, mm-hmm. they were a huge part of every every since every island. And I don't know much about law just because I'm not a member of a lodge. But obviously, they were able to share their message. They didn't have the technology that we have today. But Mm -hmm. that message was able to to be moved from island to island and shared from person to person. I know that was one mechanism. There were the women's organizations. 
then, of course, you know, the political meeting and people mm. meeting right in their neighborhoods and their communities and sharing these stories as to where we were going and what, what it was that this young political movement wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I think in latter years, remember now, we got radio. We didn't have, like, television. Mm-hmm. But people used the their radios throughout the length and breadth of the Bahamas to get news. Um, very well, many years ago, it used to take um, days for messages to move from Adelaide to Fox Hill. But yet mm-hmm. the message still got there. So when you look at those areas where we had freed slaves, whether it was Adelaide, whether it was Fox Hill, whether it was Dane and Grand Canal, that mm-hmm. message was still moved along almost like an underground communication. Right. Very, very effectively. I think that when you talk about being intentional and truly wanting to affect the change, people, once they buy into your vision and your message, they will effectively share that message for you. Right. Yeah. Awesome. That's great stuff there. So Val McInnes, McInnes is saying, watching from Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, I put the Canada in there. It's Val is a um, frequent viewer of the show, always commenting. Great to have you. Continue to do so. Share, 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 share. Uh, like, Thank like, you, like, Val. like, like. <laughs> Yes, and she's saying hello to you. So, shifting gears slightly now. So, what have we learned from the leadership of Samilo and the crew of at that time? I believe that they actually took care of each other. There were stories that we can go into where many of the team members may not have been for example, as economically empowered or in a position Mm -hmm. as some of the others, but they were their brothers and sisters keepers. They ensured that no one was left behind because they needed to ensure that they stayed together. So whatever they needed to do to help each other and uplift each other, I think that was the difference from what we see today where you have more um, um, cut through sort of internal fighting. And I'm sure they had their differences, but they were unified in their desire to take the Bahamas to another level. So they Mm -hmm. were in fact supportive of each other. They were always there. And even though they were small in numbers, they were effective because they were able to be seen as being unified, even though you would have had rifts after their success, and you would have seen dissidents that would have fallen out. But when they were fighting for that cause, there was a lot of problems, especially regarding them, and they stuck together. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about the cause, and that's that's key to me in terms of any leadership thing because you have to have a cause um, to be able to lead people towards. And so, when when we compare that era to the era um, post, then we tend to be in this era now where um, you were talking about everybody just volunteered to do, whether it's through the lodges, the churches, or whoever it was, to get things done because everybody is fighting for the same cause uh, or for a cause. But today we seem that everybody wants to get paid to to help a political party or, or, or whoever. You have to be paid. Is that because, um, that maybe I don't want to step on people's toes per se, but is that because people feel that they, there is no cause to help any of these people? The only cause will be yourself because the they don't see. But don't we, cause. don't we as a people mm-hmm. need to re energize that? You talked about the National Development Plan. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Mm-hmm. That is so important. What is the cause of the Chinese society? What do they fight for? Mm-hmm. They don't fight for incremental 
um, rewards. Rewards, yeah. They look for long-term goals as to how they're going to move their people, their country, their development, mm -hmm. everything forward. So we have a national development plan, which I think, smartly enough, the Davis administration has put a lot of its manifesto on. This mm -hmm. has got to be a huge part of our new cause as we move into our 100 years of independence. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot just look at the immediate gratification of what people like to have, whether that's mm -hmm. compensation for what they're doing or whether that's being able to have some position that they think is going to make them look good. We have now got to imbue in our people once again this strong cause that can unify us across color barriers, across monetary barriers, across political barriers. We need that buy-in again so that we can become a stronger country. If we are a stronger country, we would have, we're able to leverage ourselves even more so on this um, universal village that we're now a part of. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Patrice McDonald says, an excellent history lesson. Thank you for sharing such valuable information. Uh, you're quite welcome. Mm. Hello, Sister Patrice. <laughs> yes. And so the question I would ask then, um, we have this cause built out in, in the National Development Plan, which um, Felix Stubbs has now been reappointed chairman. And you also said on the show on um, something to think about that he's going to be the chairman and there's going to be a lot of things associated with it, with it, a new institution that will make it more um, statutory and new laws to support it and the like. So it's going to be more than just a whim, that I call it a whim, where somebody could just get up one morning and change their mind and switch gears, per se. So that's good that we could build a vision again that people would want to follow. Uh, and I think our forward. failures are sometimes due in big part to the political opposition. Hmm. Felix Stubbs, as I know him, is a nationalist. Right. He worked right. very, very hard on the blueprint for the um, National Development Plan. He and persons like Sean McQueenie and other learned persons who I think have a full understanding of the importance of buy-in, mm -hmm. it's perfect. Because whenever the political director gets too involved in trying to bring together people, mm -hmm. it sometimes works against them, if you will. Right. So mm -hmm. as much as we can have it as a nonpartisan effort, I think that we can get a broad spectrum of behavior to understand what we need to do. And let me tell you why it's important. You have young people today who say that they cannot access crown land. Yeah. You have persons today who say they're not able to access opportunity economically. We do not have a plan for our, our land in the Bahamas. Mm. You know, and this is important. You know, investors come in and they say, oh, I'm going to buy this piece of land and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But in our national plan, we've got to have land for our people. Yeah. You understand? And we have a lot of land and we've got to decentralize our population as well. Yeah. So we've got to be able to make opportunities in our beautiful archipelago all over the Bahamas. I mean, could you imagine going to America and then we have the city of New York? Yeah. And maybe this is how we have to explain to people, while Nassau is the epicenter of what we are, we are so much more than New Providence. Mm -hmm. And so in our national development plan, we've got to make sure that people understand the value of our constitution. They have to understand the rights they have under their constitution. We've got to tweak the constitution in some areas. 
But we've also got to make it that Bohemians are not feeling marginalized in our country. And if the National Development Plan can bring some of those components together, people understand. They talk about sovereign wealth. That is important to our people. Mm-hmm. You know, while we may not be drilling for oil, we have massive wealth in the Bahamas, in our waters. And so we've got to be able to show people how they can participate and be shareholders in that. And this is what the National Development Plan will be addressing. Yes. Awesome stuff. And yes, that's very much so as to what he explained on, um, in, in somewhat on the show and also that, um, in a think tank. That but this has got to be our next cause. Yes. Because we've now, we've reached the position of being able that every Bahamian is eligible to vote. We still do have equality of constitutional equality of our gender. But there, this, this national development plan can drive the, the cause for our next 50 years of development. Right. And I, what I liked about what he was saying is that it's going to be driven away from parliament. Uh, the structures and systems that can be put in place will make it more driven um, by the people, but or there'll be the checks and balances and the systems to be able to put in place by professionals to monitor and not just leave it up to the whims of, oh, today I felt like I needed to move the rather from sitting in that chair and put it in another chair kind of thing, and I, I, I have the power to do that. And no, those things would be disappearing. So we will, we will have a structured way of moving forward. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we can, as much as we may talk about the Chinese, there is a very powerful lesson that mm-hmm. we can take away from them. I mean, we don't want to be communist, but we need to be able to plan beyond the electoral cycle. Right. So we've got to be able to have people to buy in beyond five years. You know, I think Hubert Ingram said it very well after we had our first constitutional referendum, and it was defeated. And he said quite simply, you cannot take the people where they do not want to go. Right. Right. And that's what I was saying earlier. <laughs> they have to want to do that. So the Commodore um, has graced us with his presence today, um, somewhere out there on one boat down there in Elutra with the water, and that's what his picture is showing. So I'm assuming that's where he is for true. But um, former retired Commodore, tell us better. He was just on the show, actually, and we were talking about the um, Alukayan Sea and his proposal with the whole scenario. Um, so folks, you could just Google it and, and watch the show, and you get a lot of details on that. But he said, and thank another, you for another behavior that rose to the top in his field mm-hmm. and is now telling us the importance of our Lucayan history and our waters, mm-hmm. you know, and has written a book. And Bahamians yep. need to, okay, I want to rephrase this. If Bahamians are not going to read, then we have got to format and use technology just as you do, Happy to reach them on these different platforms. Because one of the things that we are weak in is that we do not read enough. So we've got to be able to impart information through um, media like what you're doing, and people can pick it up at their leisure, and Mm -hmm. they're able to listen and understand and learn. Right. You know, and um, and keep the post up there, um, Madam Producer, but one of the things that I why we did the show was just that because people always say you want to hide something from the Bahamians put it in a book or put it in writing and they won't take the time to to read it not that they don't read but maybe they won't read the long things but I find a lot of another part to it is getting the proper context as to what is documented because a lot of times we get perspectives or per, per context from one person from point of view uh, and it might be tainted um, or biased, and so it's not necessary. So then you, you know, you just got to keep going and going and going to formulate your own thing. But when we do something in media like this, or video media and so forth, what I find is you don't have to be looking at our faces all the time. Uh, 
instead of playing the radio in the car or in the way, put it on in the background and just let it play. But what I Absolutely. ask people to do is to just share, 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 let it go wide. So that the more people it gets to, to me, is going to change the narrative. And that's one of the things that we say on the show that we want to change the narrative. Because when we change the narrative, the mindset of the people are going to change and they're going to see that they can do the things like Samalo and, and the rest would have caused people to feel whole. We will now feel to another level of whole and be able to move forward from strength to strength. But well, I want to commend you because you haven't just started this and you're absolutely right. People can download your show. They can listen to it wherever they are. It is so important. And you talk about sometimes having a different view. Well, even the Bible has different translations. Mm, that's true. <laughs> and history, mm. when you break it into two words, it's his story or her mm. story because mm. it is as how that other person remembers it. So I may not be on the same page as you are on certain issues, but as we come together and we discuss it or we talk about it, people are able to take away all of our stories and formulate their own thoughts. Right. Yes. Awesome. So Commodore says, uh, thank you for another insightful episode. Happy Loretta Butler Turner made some very important points to us to move forward the next 100 years as Bahamians. Wishing you both the very best as you move forward. As we move forward as a nation. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you kindly, um, Commodore. And also you, Loretta, for those words of confidence uh, and so forth that we move forward. So when we look at this now, because we're talking really about the part of the saying that I say, when we pause, look at the intentional, and then where we go from here. And this is what we'll be talking about, where we go from here um, in this discussion as to how did we leverage what some Milo and the Linden and the whole crew back then would have built? Because, you know, we have all of these institutions built and, and so forth. But one of the things I think we're missing out is on developing uh, leaders. As um, I don't know, we have a, a national institute for the development of leaders in this country. And I'm not just talking about political leaders. I'm talking about leaders, period. Whether they in the church, whether they in civic society or business or wherever it is, I think there should be some aspect of it because I tried to scan UB's, uh, University of the Bahamas' programs that they have online, and I really don't see anything significant. Um, well, let me not share with to you. Knock them, but go ahead. Last Tuesday at this very hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was at the Franklin G. Wilson Center at UB mm -hmm. speaking to a master's class that is being taught by Dr. Tanya McCartney, and they are building effective leadership. And awesome. when you say leadership, as you've correctly noted, it's not just leadership on the national level. It's leadership everywhere, Everyone. wherever you are. And so, you know, so Franklin has been a huge, huge benefactor to UB. And so I think that building stands as a testimony to his commitment and the commitment mm. of others to developing and educating leaders throughout our country. We can do this in our regular classroom, but we do need to ensure that we make sure that at the tertiary level, mm -hmm. there are opportunities for behaviors to develop these leadership skills. Yes, and so I tip my hat to those there. And so Howard L. Barrett says, my good brother says, listening from Dominica, that's the pretty island down there in the Caribbean. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I appreciate you much. And when you talk um, about Dominica, I don't say welcome. When you talk about the development of the Bahamas, 
you know, the census just showed that our population is growing very slowly. As a matter of fact, under the norm. And what do we do as we move forward over the next 50 years? Dominica, as you will know, actually had a migration of persons that came to the Bahamas mm -hmm. that actually helped in our development from independence and beyond. So it's not just about Bahamas, so we've got to look at things like migration and immigration and how we're going to reach the fullest potential. Every great nation has a melting pot of individuals that come and contribute it in a positive way. So mm -hmm. hello to Dominica. We have several names, I will call them, of prominent Bahamians who came from Dominica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, teacher who's also from there. So that's awesome stuff. And, you know, we, we, we like to sometimes get in these talks about the sea and the Caribbean and the Bahamas and the part of the Caribbean and all the guys. But we all one big CARICOM group of countries. And so it, it's good for the region for us to work hand in hand and build each other as we move forward. Absolutely. So, so my, my last significant question to you would be, can we bottle the strengths of this journey and pass it on to our children so that they could be productive in moving the new cause forward and achieving these things? Because we seem to be, I'm a part of the, what I call the promised generation. Uh, and it seemed like that promise just ran over a lot of our heads, but, um, we need the energy. I don't know if you watch basketball, but I mean, last night, if you saw how Sacramento and their average age is below 25, 26 years of age, and the energy that they put into efforts to beat the champions, the Golden State Warriors in game two, we need some of that. And I think that's what we're really missing in our governance and our leadership, et cetera. We have a lot of people with wisdom doing, but we don't have the energy part and the, and the wisdom isn't listening to the energy who might come up with ideas. So we have that disconnect. So my, my, ask, my question to you is how do then we, we like I asked you earlier, did the Somalo, those actions, galvanize the people? How do we now galvanize the gal, blah, blah, blah. I'm tired. galvanize, galvanize our younger the people, generation? Right, so that we can move I forward. Think I think that's a really great question. First of all, I'm, I'm 60 plus, but thank goodness I have children that are millennials. Mm -hmm. I look to them for the innovation. We've got to encourage our young people to be the disruptors, to be the innovators, and not just encourage them in words. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to say, that I'm also a consultant to the Small Business Development Center, right. which I see so much talent, so much creativity. Um, and these are generally young people. I don't think all is wrong. I think the government has got to continue to do what it's doing in terms of financing these opportunities for young people, integrating them into the mainstream. If you were to go to OPM, I must say, I see a lot of young people there that are heading up very important departments, mm -hmm. which means there is a desire to ensure that we are mentoring that next generation. And they mm -hmm. do have the energy. And they're the ones, you look at my cousin Franklin at yeah. Alive, you know, he's always out there ensuring that the latest innovations are there. Uh, he's just one of so many, and he surrounds himself with other people like that. I think mm -hmm. this is a good time to be a part of the Bahamas. I think if the government continues to put the resources that are needed to attract and allow our young people to innovate, create, and disrupt, I think that's the energy that we're going to need. Awesome, awesome. Well, I've asked you a lot of questions, and I don't see any other questions um, popping in from the, the, the crew out there in social media. 
But um, what would you like to share with us in closing that we might not have covered that this you think is important to share to the public? I believe I want to share this with you because I think that this podcast that I'm doing with you today is really because of a podcast we're doing as a family. Right. And the reason why we we're doing what we're doing, and it really is a brainchild of my cousin Franklin, is to be able to share the experiences, the adversity, and the opportunity that we have even sometimes when we think that we don't have the best environment to be creative, to be successful. Um, I think we've got to do more of this. You're doing it in on your platform. We're doing it. I believe that we've got to make sure that we encourage and grow our future through the next generation and the generation after. Awesome. And we need to know when to leave. Persons like us. When to do what? To leave. To leave? Well, you know, the, the studies show that the, the most productive people in the world is between 70 and 80, and then the. <laughs> well, no, 60 I mean, in terms of, you know, frontline national oh, yeah, 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 yeah. progress. Well, I, yeah. I, anyway, that'd be another hour we start talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you yeah. so very much. And thank you to your beautiful audience and your questions. And your lovely producer, thank you so much for having me, Dale. You're quite welcome, and we really appreciate you being here uh, and taking the time. And uh, you, you helped me on on the foundation because I was going to ask you about that as to how 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 podcasts like this and what you're doing with the foundation and how we could have more people do these type of things to to cause. Uh, society to be able to pause, think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go kind of thing. So that we could bring everybody together working towards one common goal instead of all of this riffraff stuff that taking the, the majority of the focus of media because I mean that's mainly why I started because I was just fed up watching the house. I couldn't even watch the house for more than five minutes and watching the news and the, and the newspapers, it was like 90% politics or crime. And so I was like, we have to have more to life than that. Absolutely. Um, and I congratulate you for even doing it because you really, you know, coming from telecommunications yourself, you mm -hmm. understand the importance of communication. Yeah. And thank mm -hmm. you very much. Yeah. And sorry we forgot to, to share more of the pictures, but, you know, it's, we'll put them up on the, on the, um, pages, the first space. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. All right. You do well, and we will see you next time. And I will send a message to your good cousin. So hopefully, he can come on um, um, soon to speak of the business side of Samilo and the generational impact. Because I think between those two things, um, there's a great model as to how we could be successful in the Bahamas if we were to learn nuggets from those things. And then you have the the great Sunshine Boys model. It's also helped in terms of building wealth in the Bahamas. That is true. So thank you kindly, and we will see you soon. You're welcome. God bless. Bye-bye. Oops, the wrong way. What am I doing? Boom. All right. So folks, you've been watching something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles, and... We hope that you found value in the show, that there's a lot of nuggets that you're able to take away, learn from what was done in the past that generated a lot of success. Um, because just about 90 odd or 95 odd percent of our institutions in the country and so forth was initiated and built by that generation of our leaders and so forth. And so we need to be able to get back to that point where we are moving the Bahamas forward as fast and as upward as as that. And so we look forward to more shows. Um, let us know who you would like to hear from, who you want us to interview, what topics, etc. 
and we'll do our best to to get them to become um, guests on the show. Madam producer, everybody on social media, thank you kindly. Don't forget to pause, think about it with intentional thought, and consider where we go from here. To enjoy. <music> Enjoyed the show? Then subscribe to us for more educational and inspirational content. Ring the bell so you never miss a show. Let's change the narrative, 242.